It's my pleasure to introduce to you our three presenters for today's session. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to begin with Gina Russo. And Gina, I am going to turn things over to you to begin our session and to introduce yourself and your two colleagues. All right, thank you, Jessica. My name is Gina Russo, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for our Florida Fish and Wildlife Stock Enhancement Research Facility. I'm joined today by our research scientists, Ms. Ann McCarthy and Ms. Carrie Mesner, who will be talking to you in just a few moments. Our Stock Enhancement Research Facility is the state of Florida's only operated marine hatchery. It's located on the southeastern shore of Tampa Bay, just south of our Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, which is located in downtown St. Petersburg. So you cross over the bridge up to Port of Manatee, and that's where you'll find our current hatchery. Now we are moving to a new location just north of where we currently are in a little town called Apollo Beach. So what is stock enhancement? That is the question of the day. Stock enhancement is the rearing of fish, such as red drum and common snook, or invertebrates like bay scallops or queen conch, in a hatchery and releasing them into the wild to increase the natural supply of juveniles. So why stock hatchery fish? Well, fisheries managers can use hatchery fish to replenish fish stocks that have been threatened or depleted due to habitat loss, pollution, overfishing, and even from natural occurrences like red tides, hurricanes, and those cold kill events that you hear about. It's also used to increase your fishing opportunity. See that? That could be you. So how do fisheries managers ensure that everyone has the opportunity to catch a fish? Well, there are several tools in the manager's toolbox, but one of the most important ones is habitat protection. A habitat is a place where animals live to find food, evade predators, and it's very important to protect that habitat and restore that habitat where it's lost. Another tool is fisheries regulations or fishing laws. These are your seasons on the fish or when you can catch them, your size limits, your bag limits. These are very important to follow and that maintains a sustainable fishery. Now, stocking hatchery fish, if done responsibly, could be another tool in the fisheries manager's toolbox. So we're an aquaculture facility. We farm raise fish. But people have been farm raising fish around the world for centuries, one of which is for human consumption or food. How many of you have gone to a restaurant and got a fish sandwich? Or you like to eat oysters or clams? Those are all farm raised and shipped around the world to restaurants so you can consume them. It's also for the pet trade. How many of you have got fish at home, like a clownfish or a bay duck? Well, many of those fish are farm raised in hatcheries and shipped around the world to pet smarts and pet stores so that you'll have opportunity to take one home. It's also used to support commercial recreational marine fisheries, and it's used to rebuild wild stock populations, which is what we do, conservation. So there are two types of aquaculture. There's extensive aquaculture and intensive aquaculture. In the extensive aquaculture system you see here, fish are raised in outdoor ponds using water that comes in from an outside source. So in this case, this would be Tampa Bay. Water is pumped in from Tampa Bay to the fish grow out pond. Wastewater is funneled into a treatment pond, filtered, and then returned back to Tampa Bay. This is called an open system. In the intensive aquaculture system up here, you'll see fish are raised indoors in tanks using recirculating aquaculture systems. This means the waste or solids are removed from the water the water is returned, filtered, and brought back to the system to be used again. This is what we call a closed system. Now, intensive aquaculture is the future of stock enhancement in Florida, and there are many benefits. For example, we have total biological control indoors. We can control the water temperature, the salinity, uh, even work on disease and parasites, and just make sure there's no birds or any animals that will eat your food like we would in the outdoor pond. It requires much less land, obviously, since you've seen all those ponds. Indoors, you wouldn't need as much space. And we use much less water, as you saw. We are reusing and recovering that water. We don't need as much. So overall, it leaves a smaller footprint, and that's what we want. So the fish that we're rearing today in our hatchery are called red drum. We just call them redfish. That's a common name. Red drum gets its name because they're in the drum family of fishes, like black drum, croaker, spotted sea trout. And they're called red drum because they have that red hue and that one round spot or oscillated spot on both sides of the tail. Depending on where you live, you may even call them spot tails, maybe red bass or channel bass. For today's presentation, we're just going to call them redfish. So why redfish? 
Well, they were the first true marine fish to be spawned in captivity. They are very hardy and adapt well to being reared outdoors, indoors. They can be reared all year round. So they became the model fish for stock enhancement in Florida. So let's follow the life cycle of Ruby the redfish. It starts out here near shore where the parent fish, what we call broodstock, are spawning near the inlets and passes. The fish will release the egg and sperm into the water column where the eggs will become fertilized. Once fertilized, it will produce an oil droplet that gives that egg the characteristic to float. And this is where Ruby's life begins, as a fertilized egg. The currents and tides take that egg into the estuary where they'll hatch within 18 to 24 hours, depending on the temperature. Then she'll stay in the estuaries and rivers till about six months old, that's about a six inch long fish, and she'll move back out into the bay where she'll meander around feeding and doing her thing until she becomes a mature fish. At that point, she'll move near shore with those other spawning aggregations to hopefully contribute to the fishery herself. So now I'd like to hand off to Ms. Ann McCarthy, who will be talking to you about broodstock collecting. That's great. Thank you, Gina. So let's advance the slide. So broodstock or parent fish are, in fact, collected from the wild. And if we need a few fish, we could use a hook and line. Uh, for inshore fishing, for larger groups of fish, we could use the trammel net. And uh, a purse stain for, again, larger groups of fish, but more uh, offshore areas. At our current hatchery, the fish are brought into our one-acre ponds, and those are the ones uh, on the left, uh, the left row of ponds on that aerial photo. Uh, in our new facility, we will have a large tank designated for this purpose. And when we're ready to begin a study or a fish production run, we bring the fish uh, into the hatchery and stock equal numbers of male and female fish. And at this time, we would also take their lengths and weights, and uh, each fish is tagged so that we can follow them as uh, individuals throughout their time in our hatchery. So we've got our first video to share. So in the tanks here, the fish are fed three times a week, and their diet includes a mixture of gulf shrimp, squid, and various types of bait fish, uh, such as Boston mackerel, threadfin herring, and also cigar minnows. So we use a, a computer-based system to control the physical equipment that provides a set number of daylight hours, and also the water temperature for the fish. Uh, we can therefore mimic seasons, and we simulate uh, fall conditions for spawning. And those conditions are 10 hours of daylight and 73.4 uh, degree water. Uh, by increasing the water to 78.8 degrees um, over a period of 12 to 14 hours, the fish are actually triggered to release eggs and sperm. And that results in millions of fertilized eggs for us to grow in the hatchery. So we have another video for you guys. This broodstock tank is big enough to put an Amazon delivery van inside. There are 15 females and 15 males swimming around. The males have the dark stripe on their backs. Here we see the fish bunching together around a female and after a flurry of activity, eggs and sperm are shed into the water. This is called spawning and happens when we increase the water temperature from a cooler holding temperature. Out in the hatchery, this piece of filtration equipment starts foaming and alerts us that the fish are spawning. So I'd like to share a piece of the same video uh, with you guys, but with the actual audio attached. So I would like you to try and listen for the drumming sound. And both male and female can make this drumming sound, but it is usually the males. Cool, right? So now over to Gina with our first polling question. Okay, everybody. Question number one. How does the male red drum produce that drumming sound? Hmm. Let's see. We'll give you a few seconds to cast your vote. Is it by using vocal cords, swimming very fast, using muscle to rub against the swim bladder? Slapping their pectoral pins against their bodies? What do you think? All right, we'll close the poll in five, four, three, 
three, two, one. Let's see what everybody says. Using muscles to rub against their swim bladder. Majority rules. Yes, very good. The drumming sound is produced by these very specialized sonic muscles that vibrate against the inflated swim bladder. So it's similar to running your fingers along a balloon. So yes, of course, fish don't have balloons in their gut. But as you can see here, this here is that specialized muscle. And right here is their swim bladder. Back to you, Anne. Okay, so what in the world do we do now that there's millions of fertilized eggs? So we can check out our next video. Eggs from the broodstock tank flow into a mesh basket. We gently collect up to 300 mils of floating eggs to stock into an incubator. Often, multiple incubators are stocked. The rest are discarded after we measure the total volume. A tank with 15 females can produce an average of four soda bottles full of eggs, but we only keep and count a portion of them. Under the microscope, we count healthy looking eggs as shown here. Sometimes we see unhealthy looking eggs like these ones, but they all go into incubators together. One bucket of eggs per incubator. Seawater for incubation is 78 degrees. We can incubate 2.6 million eggs. With the water gently spinning and aeration added, eggs hatch within 24 hours. Our six incubators can produce close to 2 million red drum larvae. So I wanted to show a few images um, of egg development after fertilization. So if we start in the upper left corner here, we see that first cell division, so those two cells. And then uh, they divide again into four cells and then eight. And that uh, mass pattern is uh, occurring every 20 minutes at these early stages. So it's really, really rapid. So again, like Gina was saying, um, after 18 to 24 hours, uh, we have a fully formed larvae that you can see in the lower right corner. So with that being said, we'll go back to Gina with our next polling question. Okay, polling question number two. How many eggs can one female redfish or red drum Produce at one time. Is it 10 eggs, 20,000 eggs, 500,000 eggs, or maybe a million or more eggs? Wow, many of you are guessing a million. We'll give you a couple more seconds and then close the poll at five, four, three, two, one. Wow, we got a couple different votes. But the answer is actually 1 million eggs or more. So that's one female fish producing 1 million eggs at one time. That's enough to fill a one quart jar. Now remember, counting the number of eggs that we stock into the incubators is very important in a hatchery. So remember to count your eggs before they hatch in your home activity. And you can do the same as our scientists. Thanks, so now what happens? to all of those hatched larvae. So we'll get our next video queued up. Larvae are moved out of the incubators and into these larval rearing tanks the day after hatching. We look at the larvae under the microscope to make sure they appear normal, and then we very gently count and stock them. After two more days, the larval yolk sac is absorbed and food is offered. Rotifers are the correct size to fit in the fish's mouths. Rotifer stomachs look green because of the highly nutritious diet they eat. When fish eat rotifers, their guts also appear green. Rotifers are grown in a separate area of the hatchery. As the fish grow, they can eat larger prey. Ten days after hatching, tiny shrimp called artemia are added to the tanks of fish. Artemia are orange, so when the fish eat them, their guts also appear orange. Artemia are grown in large tanks in a separate area of the hatchery. Every day, one batch of artemia are hatched, while a second batch that has been packed with nutrition are fed to the fish. Around 14 days after hatching, tiny pellets called microdiet is offered through specialized feeders mounted on the tanks. The larval rearing tanks have a motor-driven sweeper to stop solid waste from building up on the tank bottom, and that saves our fish culture technicians lots of time. 
So um, we're going to play this little snippet for you guys. And I just want you to look at the size of the fish and just really understand how small these guys are. But you can clearly see uh, some of their features, such as their big eyes. Big eyes used to see their prey. So we're over to Gina and the third polling question. Okay, what do those baby redfish eat? Hmm, could it be pizza? Could it be zooplankton? Worms? Or maybe seagrass? We'll give you a few seconds to cast your vote. And we will close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what everybody voted. Oh, most people got this correct. It's actually zooplankton. No, they do not eat pizza. They do eat these tiny microscopic animals called zooplankton. And since they're so tiny, you can't see them with your naked eye, but you can view them under the microscope, and they look like this. Little bundles of nutrients swooping through the water. Well, I am actually going to say goodbye for now, and I'm going to pass it over to Carrie. So thank you guys for listening. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I hope that you have enjoyed learning about how we grow the redfish in our hatchery. And now I would like to talk to you about how we stock our hatchery fish, harvest and release them into the wild. So as you've seen, we have the egg that hatches into a larvae. In about 30 days, they will grow into a one-inch fish, which is about the length of a quarter, maybe a little bit more. And during that time, we're looking at how they're feeding and growing and managing their health and make sure that they're healthy before we release them into the wild. So let's look at that process of how we do the harvest and release. When the fish reach the target size and they are health certified, and eating well, they are ready for harvest and release. Soft mesh nets, a fish pump, and hoses filled with water are used to move them from their tank to a holding box so that they can be sampled. Staff sample the fish to determine the number of fish that will be released. We sample them by placing them in known weights of water on a scale and then get the weight of the fish plus the water. We count how many fish are in a sample bucket. All buckets of fish are weighed before they go in the truck. We use the sample weight and count of the fish to determine how many fish are loaded to the truck in total. Fish are transferred to our transport where they are placed in compartments with water and oxygen and life support. This transport truck is like an aquarium on wheels and it is used to safely take the fish on the road to the release location. At the boat ramp near the selected release location, the fish are transferred from the transport to the net well of the boat. Once the fish are loaded, the boat is driven to a near shore location with habitat that will support, protect, and feed the fish. Shown here are 63,000 fish released into the Peace River. You will notice the color change of the water in the net well of the boat. Water from the release site is added to the fish to get them used to the water quality of the location they are being released in. Fish are carefully netted to the water near the red mangroves shown here. The red mangroves and other estuarine habitats such as salt marshes will provide shelter from predators and the food they need in a nursery environment to give the fish the best chance at survival. And next, I believe we will have our next polling question and back to Gina. <laughs> Our final polling question at that. Here we go. What is a habitat? Now let's see how many of you were paying attention earlier today. Could it be salt marshes, a place where animals live, mangrove trees, seagrass flats? Hmm, I see many people answering a place where animals live. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to cast your vote. And we'll close the poll in five, four, three, Two and one. And the answer is Yay. all of the above. You are all correct. It is a place where animals live. 
It's a place or an environment where animals can find food, shelter, and avoid predators. So you were all correct. Okay, excellent. So let's take a look at some of the preferred habitats of the juvenile redfish. So shown here are mangroves, seagrasses, and salt marshes. They're all vegetative plant uh, water in the water. They have um, prop roots or dense, basically kind of like a field of grass underwater and they're able to keep fish safe in them. Imagine yourself as being a tiny little fish that is out swimming next to those prop roots and all of a sudden a bird or a big fish come at you. You could kind of escape into those prop roots and it's kind of like a cage that would keep them out and protect you from them. There's also lots of food sources in those um, salt marshes and seagrasses and mangroves such as shrimp, crabs, other tiny fish, amphipods that they can eat. So it's a good nursery habitat for many marine species. In fact, great, they protect greater than 75% of our marine fish species in uh, the nursery environment. So they're very important to us. What will we do without that habitat? No habitat, no fish, right? So when we select our release sites, we select them based on the habitat that's available for them to make sure that when we put them out there, they have a good chance at survival. There are many things that might reduce the habitat that is available out there, such as pollution, building, um, con other construction events, and even natural events such as red tide. So it does get destroyed. So what can we do to make sure that that habitat is available for our fishery stocks? And what can you do, more importantly, to help us do that? Well, we can all participate in habitat restoration projects. Every community has volunteer programs where you can find something to do where you can go clean up garbage, you can plant grasses, you can put out some oyster reefs. Coastal cleanups are hosted all the time where you can go out to the beach and, and pick up your garbage. And of course, do not throw trash in, in the, the land, the world. We want to keep it clean for everybody. Also, make sure you're following those fishing laws and regulations. Scientists work uh, to look at the fish and the biology of the fish and their life history to make sure that when we're going out there catching them, we're not catching them at a time that they're vulnerable or the wrong sizes. So follow those rules and regulations. And of course, always practice fish, best fishing practices, you know, catch and release, recycle your fishing line. A lot of the boat ramps have those containers where you can put that fishing line in so we're not leaving it out there and getting our wildlife entangled in it. So that's it. We appreciate your time. Hope you enjoyed our presentation. Uh, please let us know if you have any questions. And we're so happy to see you all today. Thank you. Thank you, Gina, Anne, and Carrie for taking us into the world of fisheries stock enhancement. So it's now time for the Q&A portion of our session. We have received several questions throughout the presentation. Feel free to type in a couple more. We have a few minutes left. And we did receive one question prior to today, so we're going to begin with that one. Uh, what do you use to clean the facilities? Carrie, do you want me to take that one? Okay, so um, cleaning is very important. Uh, we do operate in a what we would call a biosecure facility. So we want to uh, keep anything that could be detrimental um, to the fish out. And uh, long, long story short, we use a couple different products. Um, most are chlorine based, uh, but there's also ones um, specifically uh, that are, are used in aquaculture um, and uh, it's called Vercon. That's a, a go-to. Thank you. Our next question, is it harmful if you release too many? And I'm assuming this means too many fish. Okay. Well, yes, I mean, we, yes, we always need to be very responsible in the numbers uh, that we release. There are a lot of statistical models that are used for determining those numbers. Um, we have to make sure they're healthy. We have to make sure that we use the right genetics. So those are always considered when we select our release location. It, it could be harmful if we release too many. So we're looking at the natural stocks and trying to model based on the numbers that are fishery scientists and statisticians have looked at. Thank you, Carrie. Our next question, how long do you quarantine the fish? It's also a good question. So um, 
A lot of it is based on the life cycle of the parasites that are common to those fish. So the general rule is about 30 days. Longer is even better if you can, but um, a month is based on, like I said, the life cycle of the parasites that tend to kind of attack them that we need to make sure we don't bring into our hatch. Question, this is a good one. I'm kind of curious about this one too. Does feeding them cause them to lose their wild insects? Tough, tough question. Tough question. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, also a good question, yeah. There's a lot of um, behavioral studies out there, so uh, that's actually one of the things that we, we have looked at and can plan to continue to look at is um, making sure that they're not affected by that. So sometimes there's programs that a lot of facilities have where they'll actually start introducing the wild feed back to them before that they're released so that they are, um, you know, ready to, to go out there and be predators again. That's very good. Just looking through, we've got a bench in here. Let's see. Here's a question about, looks like this is specific to red drum. Why do they have this spot? I can't answer that one. Now, a lot of fish adapt into their environment in order to survive. So they may be different colors, different shapes, um, and have different features. So we talked about red drum having the reddish hue and the spot on the tail. Well, the reddish hue on the dorsal or top of the fish enables the fish to actually camouflage in the wild, especially in that really dark tannic water of the bay, so that they can't be seen from above. They also have a very white belly. That is for counter shading so that a predator on the bottom of the water or the bottom of the ocean, like a shark, wouldn't be able to see the, the fish above him because it would, the whiteness would blend into the sunlight. But the reason why they have the spot on the tail, it mimics a, a false eye. So it looks like the fish's head and it actually is the fish's tail. So in this case, if a predator like a shark were to come and try to make a meal out of the red drum, it would actually grab the back of the tail and not his head, which obviously we know fish can live without their fins or tail, but obviously they can. Right. Thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. I do apologize if you weren't able to get to everyone's question today. Uh, that is actually the end of our session. So Gina, Ann, and Carrie, I would like to thank you again for taking the time to join Absolutely. us and share your research with us.